Let me move a little more further east now. The sad events of the weekend which we witnessed in Japan. Tokyo is the third biggest city that uh, you've had. Uh, and at the same time, I also want to bring in another perspective that is being talked a lot today in India and perhaps even globally than it was before. The whole philanthropy uh, movement, so to speak. I do understand that that's something that's close to your heart and you've been working on it perhaps for many years uh, without necessarily talking about it. I know I'm mixing two questions here, but given the events there and uh, given the kind of uh, the fact that we have a Warren Buffett coming down, a Bill Gates coming down to India, we just about getting sensitized as far as the India Inc. is concerned about the importance of this, uh, of philanthropy, of sharing your wealth, of trying to help an inclusive growth. How would you address our captains of industry and tell them that the way you would look at it and the way it should be done, it should not be just a dole, right? I mean, how would you handle that and how would you tell them? Well, I, I, I think that these are intensely personal decisions and th there is a unique set of circumstances that goes with, with each one of them. I will just take a minute and tell you how I look at it from our company's perspective. And that is, we have uh, an 85% shareholder in Michael Bloomberg. The context that I put this in for my colleagues around the world is that we work to a higher purpose every day. And that higher purpose is on two levels. One is the fundamental mission of Bloomberg, which is to create transparency in the world of the opaque. And in doing so, democratize the flow of information, free up capital for reinvestment in the private sector and the public sector as we change the way our customers do business around the world. And that's the first level. The second level, which is unique to Bloomberg, is that 85 cents of every dollar of value that we create for Mike Bloomberg will fund the second largest foundation after the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And we're gonna cure cancer. And we're gonna stop or dramatically reduce traffic deaths in emerging countries around the world. And we're gonna uh, help stamp out smoking and some of the other fundamental issues around health that's so important to the global economy. Um, you mentioned, for example, Japan. We will, as a company, reach out and be very philanthropic, not only with the use of our employees' time to help in northern Japan, but also in terms of fundamentally providing the Red Cross and some other organizations. We're in the process of choosing who those organizations will be with some incremental funding to help them deal with this tragic moment. Um, from, from the point of view of, of Indi Indian entrepreneurs, and uh, I think Azim Premji is a perfect example where he is using a substantial amount of his personal wealth as it relates to elementary and secondary education, particularly in, in poor states in India to ensure that that, that level uh, is raised and with it go their economic aspirations, their ability to contribute to society. So, so from our point of view, from my company's point of view, and from our founder and largest shareholder's point of view, a key mission of what we do every day is fundamentally focused on giving back, making the world a much better place beyond the fundamental business mission of Bloomberg LP. Is the Bloomberg Foundation active in India as well, or you intend to be? Uh, it's, you, you know, my responsibility ends with kind of delivering liquidity to them oh, so that they can so do they can that. Spend. Uh, but but I'm, I'm confident that uh, as part of the, it is global in scope, uh, it is very focused on four or five specific areas, uh, and I'm, I'm sure that India is part of that, uh, of that uh, portfolio. Okay. Let me now turn to media. Uh, one of the things that you did more recently, about a year ago, was uh, the purchase of Business Week. And that was the time when everybody was writing of print itself and saying print is dead and it's all going to be online, and it's all going to be new media. You've not only just bought it, you've also turned it around, and it's doing far better than what it was. How would you see print evolving, and what are the plans you have for Business Week? Well, uh, let me start with Business Do we get to see it in India soon? That's uh, question. Well, stay tuned. <laughs> okay. the, uh, there is a huge amount of excitement in our company around our short-term successes with Business Week. As you said, we closed on it December 1st of 2009. We relaunched the magazine in April of 2010. The issue for us was how do we take a, uh, a very well-regarded name and bring the relevance back to the publication so people really see a need to use it and read it and tell their friends about it. 
Uh, and I think we've made tremendous, tremendous headway. At the same time, from a financial point of view, we've dramatically reduced the operating losses of the business, and we think we have very clear visibility to financial break-even. Although that is less important to us than the role Bloomberg Business Week plays in this aspiration that we have to be the most influential news organization in the world of business and finance. We're starting to see advertising revenues increase, so the top line is starting to grow. We're starting to see a little bit of traction on the circulation line. And I think that's a, a, a direct reflection of how people perceive the editorial content and the relevance of the magazine. I was telling some colleagues this morning that uh, for the first time ever, I'm a magazine tear-out person. So I tear out articles and then circulate them to my colleagues internally. And last week's edition, there were four pieces that I tore out and sent to different parts of the firm and our leadership to say, here's something we wrote in Bloomberg Business Week that is really relevant to what we're doing in the Middle East or we're doing in India or we're doing in Russia or wherever it may be. So it's, I, I think we've, we've made great strides. Um, I think that the, the world of print media has probably bottomed out and is now starting to come back up. We see this in newspaper circulation in the United States. We see it in some of the magazine circulation. We certainly see it in advertising willing, advertisers' willingness to keep a leg in, in multiple camps on the internet, in print publications, on billboards and things like that, on television and radio. Uh, and so I think combined with uh, my comments and your question earlier on about the outlook for the, the U.S. economy and the global economy, um, I think we feel quite optimistic that print per se, Bloomberg Business Week and Bloomberg Markets Magazine are going to be the beneficiaries of a pretty solid tailwind. So you do have plans for them for India as well? Uh, you did say stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> stay tuned. <laughs> All right, okay. Uh, let me move to the online play now. I mean, we've seen this humongous valuation which a Facebook got after Goldman invested. We've seen this Huffington Post deal which happened. Many experts are now slightly perhaps more cautious than the last time the dot-com boom happened. So they're all standing up and saying, hey, is this the beginning of another bubble? What's your take on that? I mean, how do you see the nature of these deals? And if that be so, do you see Bloomberg getting majorly into that space as well going forward? Well, I, I think that uh, I've, Facebook is a phenomenon like Microsoft and Google, um, and uh, you, you have to hand it to uh, Sheryl Sandberg and, and Mark Zuckerberg for the work that they've done and the uh, influence that Facebook has across so many different sectors. When I was in Davos uh, in one of the meetings, uh, the, the chief marketing officer of Coca-Cola was talking about the implication of Facebook on their advertising strategy and so many other consumer goods companies. I was talking to Bob McDonald, the chairman and CEO of Procter & Gamble about what they're doing in social media, and the same thing. Facebook plays an incredibly important role. So, so I think what it will prove is that there is a real, viable, defensible business model from an advertising point of view, not to mention the broader implications of what social media means going forward. Uh, from, from our perspective, uh, and, and I think, I don't know whether the, the valuation is justified or not, uh, and I certainly don't know whether on some of these other companies like Groupon and Twitter and LinkedIn, whether the valuations are justified. I think there's a bit of a feeding frenzy around this, and certainly people feel as though they don't want to miss the boat. And you and I know we've been to this fire before and we've seen this movie, and in the end it doesn't play out very well. In terms of the implications for Bloomberg, I mean, we are selectively stepping our toe in the water in terms of using social media to help promote some of the Bloomberg product offerings and certainly advise our customers of new functionality and some other things that we're doing. Uh, but uh, it, it, it won't have a significant change on our overall business model, which as you know is this intensely robust application software product that provides to our customers over 30,000 separate functions that they can use to exercise their business model and execute their business strategy more efficiently and more productively. Is that the same way you would therefore describe uh, the Bloomberg app? For example, it's so popular in India here, it's right now free to download. Would you think of perhaps monetizing that at some point of time? Well, you know, in some cases uh, we're, we're able to on, on uh, mobile platforms to monetize it modestly. Uh, but uh, and it is another way to get our brand out there and enhance the overall brand equity of Bloomberg going forward. Uh, 
uh, and hopefully we will convert some of those users to the full Bloomberg professional service. You know, our view, as I think we've talked about this before, is that we are agnostic as to how our customers see our offering. We want to make sure that we can deliver it in a form that they want so they can use it either through the free application and learn <coughs> more about Bloomberg or our Bloomberg Anywhere applications as an added service to our existing subscribers.